Greetings, friends. This is Chris Batts, your host of the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. In today's episode, I spoke with an executive NBA professor, board advisor, and former general counsel of a Fortune 1000 company. We discussed her insights and current trends for public company boards and more. If you haven't already, please subscribe to this podcast and leave a review on iTunes. We interview corporate defense law firm leaders, partners, general counsel, and legal consultants. You're listening to episode 48 of the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. Broadcasting from Kansas City, this is the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. In each episode, you'll receive actionable ideas and hear personal leadership stories of both men and women serving as leaders and executives in the legal industry. Enjoy a front row seat as Chris Batt speaks with general counsel, legal consultants, and law firm leaders and law partners at the top corporate defense law firms from around the United States. Welcome to the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Batts with The Lion Group. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Jeannie Latz, board consultant. Jeannie has served as an executive vice president, chief legal officer, and corporate secretary of Great Plains Energy, a Fortune 1000 publicly traded holding company where she held operational responsibility, including legal, human resources, internal audit, technology, and facilities management. Currently, She consults boards of public and private companies in the areas of corporate governance best practices, strategic implementation, risk management, securities regulation, and legal affairs. She's a member of the faculty of the Executive MBA program at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, Henry W. Block School of Management. She holds the Distinction of Governance Fellow, granted by the National Association of Corporate Directors. Jeannie received her law degree from the University of Missouri, Kansas City School of Law. Welcome, Jeannie, to the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. It's great to have you on the show. Thank you, Chris. I look forward to speaking with you today. Jeannie, how long have you been a board consultant? So I have worked with boards, not-for-profit boards, and other aspects of boards for a period of time, and primarily because that's always been actually a very strong interest of mine. And also, I acquired some expertise for that earlier in my career. So during my time at Great Plains Energy, not only as chief legal officer, but I also acted as corporate secretary. So I was the liaison between management and the board. And that was an area of practice that I really enjoyed. And it's where I found that I spent a lot of my extra time and was active and have and still active in a number of organizations in that area as well. So it's an area that I gravitate to. Jeannie, with everything that's going on right now, would you please share with my audience the current issues boards are being faced with today? Well, being a board member has always been a big job. And boards have always had huge responsibilities. But now with every business impacted, uh, regardless of the type of business, their responsibilities and the need for boards is even greater. And particularly, I would say, at managing risk. We've entered into such an area with so many risks. And depending on the type of organization, your risks are different. There may be liquidity risk, there may be operational risk, but every organization is facing some type of risk now in a greater degree than it was before. And also, strategically, every strategy of every organization has been turned up on its head in some way, shape, or form. But probably the biggest challenge for boards today is the unknown. So we could put another strategy in. We could come up with a way to manage risk if we knew where we were headed, but we don't. So boards are having to look at many different scenarios and actually put in place different scenarios so that regardless of how long and where we end up, They have a plan in place that will allow their company to remain sustainable. So it's a huge responsibility. Board membership always took a lot of time. It's taking even more now. And the importance of teamwork and communication with management teams has never been greater or been more important to boards as they move through this time. 
Jeannie, in regards to diversity, would you share with my audience what you're seeing as far as initiatives of boards? Well, the people or boards that were doing a good job were probably doing a good job prior to the last few weeks and months. But the importance of diversity, I think we've always known, particularly on boards and management teams and in in the ranks of employees as well, because of the different viewpoints and experiences that are brought through diversity, whether it be expertise, whether it be race, whether it be sex, in order to build sustainable organizations, we have to be able to see that organization through all of those lens. And to do that, that means that we need diversity on boards and we need diversity in management teams. And there's a body of well-established research now that the boards and the management teams who have embraced this concept are having better results than those who have not. So it's a matter of I, I think the best boards, we, we've seen these practices in place for a while. Maybe this is the reckoning uh, to additional boards and additional management teams in that regard as well. And hopefully, if they're not already have, not already have as diverse of organizations as they should in order to impact the best results they can deliver, they're moving that way now. When I think of leadership and action, uh, which roles are bringing diversity to the company, the board or the management? So that would depend on the organization. I'll say this. I think it is still hard because as individuals, we are most comfortable around the people who are like us. And particularly on boards, when they look for new board members, they think about colleagues or people that they're on other organizations with, or other people who their paths cross. And many times our paths do not cross a a good swath of diversity. So it's difficult for boards and management teams. And the same thing, when I'm looking for a new general counsel or new head of HR, what about that father or mother, which is on my kid's softball team? Uh, I, I see them every Tuesday night. I talk to them. I, I know they would be good in this position. So to really embrace diversity, I think you have to be willing to go beyond your own networks and you have to set up a process in which you look for candidates in a wider and a more encompassing way than left to our own devices we would do typically. Next question, Jeannie. As a recruiter, I'm approached by lots of legal executives, both in-house and law partners in the second half of their career. And it's the most common question that comes up. They're kind of entertaining this thought as they're retiring or considering retirement. How do they land these paid board roles? So that doesn't surprise me as a question. Everyone would uh, love to be on boards. First and foremost, I think, because it's such a rewarding thing to be able to do, to bring together all your business experiences and legal experiences through your career and be able to use those in um, a way that is benefiting an organization. There's just no better way to cap a, a career. Certainly, beyond a shadow of a doubt, on certain publicly held companies, there's some great monetary rewards from doing that as well. But because of the rewards, I think everyone wants to do that. So there's an extreme amount of um, competition, and there's very limited opportunities to set on boards as in comparison to the numbers of professionals there are who would like to set on them. So I would recommend a couple of things because being on a board is different. Your responsibilities are different on a board than they are in a law firm or in a corporation. Uh, So I would really advise getting involved in a couple of organizations which really have really, really good materials and good opportunities to learn about what board uh, service is all about. And um, the National Society of Corporate Directors, which is a national organization, has 
chapters, local chapters, and we have one here in the Heartland, the Heartland uh, chapter, and we have local programs, but, but also, as I said, you have the resources from a national organization, and I think it takes uh, some learning, some curiosity, some knowledge about what does a board member do. The other one, and, and I've been a member of both of these forever, uh, the other one is the Society of Corporate Governance Professionals. And actually, that is a little bit more geared toward professionals who are in um, governance functions right now. Uh, so that would be people who maybe are attorneys right now that have some responsibility for board oversight. That would be a great organization to get involved with. I just completed setting through four days of Zoom <laughs> presentations at their national meeting last week. And I'm always amazed at um, the great resources that they have. So those are a couple of things that you can do to learn more about those and maybe acquire some expertise that will help you as well. The other thing I think is important is that there's lots of opportunities to be active as a board member and really contribute, not necessarily just on publicly held companies, but smaller private companies, startup companies, not-for-profits. Um, as you leave law firms, sometimes it can be a stage of your career when it's time to give back and not-for-profits could really use that same expertise that you could bring uh, to different boards as well. So I think it's also important to be open and even advisory boards. I, I sit on the, on the advisory boards of a couple of my past students who have started businesses and that's really rewarding as well. So lots of ways to use those legal skills to contribute when you choose to kind of step back in the law firms, I think. Hi listeners, this is Chris Batts, legal recruiter and owner of The Lion Group. My team and I place legal and compliance talent around the United States and are known for our level of communication, speed, and strong track record. If you're an employer hiring your first attorney or first general counsel or adding talent to your corporate legal department or compliance team, we should talk. Also, if you're a corporate defense law partner or group wondering about your options for a lateral move, we should also talk. Every aspect of our process is confidential, fast, and thorough. Contact us by going to our website, findthelions.com, or you can text the word HEADHUNTER to the number 44222, and then complete the web form, and we'll follow up with you shortly. Now back to the show. Jeannie, would you explain to my listeners about landing board roles? What is the reality for attorneys to land paying board roles? So I've read some statistics that a very small percentage of board seats are really filled uh, through search search firms, but certainly the largest, most prestigious ones are. But I think being a member of these organizations signal uh, to the colleagues that are in those organizations and to others that you are interested in this particular area, you know, a lot of people really network. I've known people who have mapped out a five-year plan <laughs> to get on a board. It's a ton of work. It, it can be uh, comparable in time and commitment to your career. You know, the, I don't know that there's a magic bullet. What you've done in your career so, you know, there's a lot of things in our life. So sets our trajectory path. And, you know, if you've been the CEO of a large um, multifaceted corporation, you know, you're certainly in a different place than if you have been in a smaller regional company. And if you are a partner at Skadden Arbs in New York, you are certainly in a different position than a, a smaller local law firm. So part of who gets different positions is just what your past lives lead you to. But again, I think there are lots of absolutely rewarding opportunities to be on boards. And you'll find those by talking to your colleagues. It certainly doesn't hurt to let search firms, you know, have your, your resume in case they're a ma match. 
Um, I think if you're serious about it, you probably go down a lot of different paths at the same time. Thank you. Let's talk about board makeup. Who are those people that boards are hiring or recruiting right now? It's interesting that initially board members were very well-rounded, what I'll call well-rounded or multifaceted individuals in that they had a broad range of experience. And initially, oh, way over half were probably CEOs of organizations. More recently, um, because the number of CEOs are limited, and more recently, boards have thought, I need some specific, we need specific expertise. We need information technology expert. We need an HR expert. We need a supply chain expert. Uh, so more recently, and, and we need some diversity in age as well. So more recently, we have seen very boards put their matrix in place and very purposely chart out the type of person that they needed. Interesting enough, I think that pendulum is swinging back now. And maybe not swinging back to just CEOs, but swinging back to individuals that have broad experience. Because this is what I think we've learned, that Board members who come in with very specific experience can be very helpful on those issues, but may not have the breadth to deal with the overall responsibilities of the board. And then when there are issues in that specific area, the other board members tend to step back and rely on that expertise so we don't have that multifaceted input and and, um, conversation that we typically need around issues. So I think we started seeing even before COVID, you know, a slight trend back to people who had had broad experience. And I think now the crisis we're in has brought even more to light. Uh, We need people who have some breadth of experience who have maybe been through several crises before. So I think that in general is kind of the trends in the makeup of board membership. But there are some specific characteristics, I think, that are looked for, and particularly a strategic decision maker. And that's not always easy to see from a resume, but looking for people who are very good at making good, sound decisions. So I think um, we'll see how that plays out, but I, I think that's where we're headed. Jeannie, you had referred to me a book called The Perfect Corporate Board, a handbook for mastering the unique challenges of small cap companies by Adam J. Epstein, founder of Third Creek Advisors. Would you agree with Adam's assessment that small cap boards do not have enough understanding about raising capital, the world of capital markets, and then selecting the right service professionals? Sure. Let me just step back a second. So I just would like, I I met Adam through both of these organizations that I mentioned earlier. So again, how important those organizations are to meet people and get perspective. So I was very interested in, in small caps because that's where most of my opportunities were. And I was very interested in his perspective and he has written books and he has set himself apart as an expert on, on small caps. He approaches small caps in a little bit narrower view than I would in that he's primarily looking at startups or companies that are are fairly new. I think of small caps more generally in that it's the amount of shares they have outstanding versus their share price. And many times those organizations are fairly new, but not always. So sometimes they're more established and they have, you know, very reliable and appropriate lines of credit. But to the extent that we're looking at organizations which have not been in existence and don't have those kinds of facilities, super important. And we know how important that is right now and how important it was in getting the PPP loans, you know, to have an established bank and have access to capital. So access to capital breeds more access to capital. So certainly boards have to make sure that that's in in place, part of the, you know, risk oversight. Do we have access to appropriate liquidity? So to clarify, would you define small caps for me? 
small cap, I guess, could be defined a lot of different ways. I, I look at it as how the SEC kind of looks at it. So the number of shares outstanding by the market price multiplied together gives your market cap. And you could be an established company. You could have been in existence for 20, 25 years and not have that many uh, shares, or it might be not trading depending on your industry. Many industries uh, trade at a very low market price. So that's uh, really how you talk about market caps or and, and small caps. So again, it's, it's a terminology. But Adam is talking about companies that don't have a lot of shares outstanding, so they don't have a lot of access to market capital. So they need to find capital in other ways. So the term would be illiquidity. Is that a safe word to say? I don't know if that's a word or not, but maybe. <laughs> not liquidity, illiquidity. Jeannie, let's talk about a trend that is sweeping public companies and bringing pressure to public company boards aside from diversity. Well, I thought you might bring this up. This is one thing I um, had thought about. I thought you might bring up this trend toward ESG investing, which is the opposite of you know short term managing for the short term it's it's okay we've got to look at how we're impacting the environment you know we've got to look do we have obligations to be socially responsible and you know governance what's and then that in that realm they're talking about governance as ethical and moral you know what are our ethical and moral obligations and you know BlackRock kind of started, uh, their CEO's been very out there in that space for three or four years now. And now the business of that group of whatever they call them, you know, better business have endorsed that. But the most interesting thing of all are the number of funds, shareholders, who say, you know, we're only interested in investing in these companies. And so these companies are thinking, well, you know, so they're trying to figure out, well, how can I disclose or what can I say, you know, because I, in, in order that that fund will invest in, in me and it's caused this huge, big controversy at the SEC and we don't have any standards. Everybody says they're SEG, but, you know, they don't, uh, everybody, there's no continuity and the disclosures. And I, I'll admit myself, I, I, maybe we've all had our fill. I mean, I, I told my investment advisor, you know, going forward, I'm, I'm really interested in, you know, firms and I don't know how we're going to, there will be some standardization, how we pick them out at this point, but you know, who have interest. So adding value, that's, that's obviously the job of a corporation, but are who are interested in adding value to society in a more general more general way. So you're definitely right. And it's your generation that's making the change. So the greedy baby boomers are going to be blown back and then you can take over and you'll have some different ideas. Jeannie, how do you know if a board is good or doing a good job? These two things follow each other. You're not going to read in the Wall Street Journal about a good board. That isn't going to happen. So how do you know what companies have good boards? I think you can almost always see it when you read in the Wall Street Journal about companies that are executing very well. I think that means they have a really good board. And I'll use um, Microsoft as an example right now. Uh, Microsoft is executing very well. It has a very good, diverse, collaborative team on its board right now. So so you'll never read necessarily about the good board, but you'll see the evidence um, of it. So to your point, you hope there's some undervalued ones. Well, there probably will be. But usually the ones with really good boards are the ones that are doing really well and, and might not be, <laughs> be undervalued at the moment. But, you know, there's always those younger startup companies. And for whatever reason, the skills that make a good entrepreneur, and I'm going to say they're cocky, and whatever their skills are, and they're huge risk takers, make them uh, undervalue a board. They don't want anybody telling them what to do. You know, they, they, they see them as a threat instead of bringing additional expertise, because most of the time they think they don't need additional, you know, expertise. Look at WeWork, you know. So for those Younger companies who really do value boards and understand what they can bring, those might be the companies that you hop on because they've still got all this upside. You know, they haven't had time to take advantage of their potential yet. 
Let's pivot. What is your general advice to management and board members who are considering legal counsel? Well, a lot of it depends on the size of your organization and how much legal work you have in a particular area. In the corporation where I spent uh, much of my life, we had lots of SEC work. It was a very capital intensive uh, industry. So we were raising capital all the time, uh, either through the markets, issuing more stock or issuing different kinds of bonds. So we had enough work in that area to develop that expertise in-house. But if you just um, need a particular kind of legal expertise once in a while, uh, then it's it's not efficient to have that kind of expertise in-house. It's much more efficient to, to use an outside law firm. So in balancing what legal work should I do in-house versus what legal work should I do through an uh, external law firm, I think you have to look at how much of that type of work you have and if it is efficient for you to have someone in-house to to do that. Jeannie, do you as an advisor to boards have an opinion about what outside counsel should be hired? Since the 2008 crisis has created a buyer's market for clients, Adam Epstein mentioned he doesn't always recommend the largest and the biggest names in law, but you brought up Skadden. Do you agree with that? So um, I'll answer that two ways. First of all, I think it depends on what the uh, issue is. During my career, I was involved in a hostile takeover and I wanted Skadden uh, as my outside representatives. But as a practical matter, I think a lot of people are agreeing with Adam because I believe here in the Midwest, we are seeing a lot of people uh, use our Midwest law firms, even from the coast, uh, because of the way that they're priced. And they're certainly very uh, competitive in the quality of work and the price of the the work. So I would say overall, that advice is probably wise. Next question. When is it the right time for a company to hire their first attorney? Well, again, I, I think it's dependent on the amount of legal work that you have that you could adequately do in house with an inside attorney. So maybe that means there's certain kinds of work that you do over and over, negotiation of contracts, and you could certainly have that expertise in-house and utilize efficiently. But if your legal work is very, very uh, varied and you don't ever do the same thing twice in the same year, uh, then it'll be hard to develop that expertise um, in-house or make that efficient if you're going to need to go outside for that legal work anyway. I don't necessarily think you need an attorney in-house just to manage outside law firms, but of course that brings up the question, well, where there has to be you know, a place in the organization for that. So, you know, assuming that there there is. So I, I, I think you have to look at the amount of legal work and the type of legal works to, to make that decision when to bring in an inside attorney. Have you advised boards where they didn't have in-house counsel? Curious, who is managing that legal spend of the organization? So the reason I bring that up is I think that's an issue. And Sometimes it's done directly by the CEO, but again, it depends on the organization, what kind of time the CEO has and actually, you know, interest and, and experience um, that little while, you know, so sometimes you have CEOs who are very operational and may have never had a business class, let alone a, a legal class. So that's hard for them to manage. So I think you have to look at each organization. Sometimes it might be the CFO. Sometimes there might be a chief operating officer, you know, who has that business background. You know, these are these are business issues. Legal issues are business issues. So I advocate uh, in my executive MBA class to my managers there that you're responsible, every manager is responsible for legal issues that occur in your organization, the organization that you manage, uh, your department. And I, I encourage them to, yes, you'll turn those over to an outside law firm, but they need your knowledge. You know, you're, you, 
you just can't get the best outcome if you don't stay involved. So sometimes even that managing uh, of particular legal issues may be spread through the organization, depending on where the issue arises in the organization. And, and it's managed in that particular manager acts as the partner with the outside law firm in resolving that issue. Jeannie, you are an executive MBA professor. You teach courses at a local state university here. What kind of classes have you been teaching? Uh, what do you enjoy teaching? My background, as we've discussed, is a combination of law and I have an undergraduate degree in business. And I, I don't know which one I, I like the best. Uh, it would be hard for me to choose if I like business the most or if I like uh, law the most. And that's why an in-house position was perfect for me. So I guess I have particularly enjoyed the opportunities I had to, to teach those aspiring executives in the executive MBA class a little bit about the law and not to make them attorneys, but to help them understand a little bit about the law that I believe will bring them a competitive advantage as a manager and to their organizations to understand something about labor law, to understand the basic premises of a of a good contract. So I feel that that's an opportunity for me to, I guess, practice what I believe so much is how you can't separate a successful business from knowing something about the law because the law impacts every aspect of business. Jeannie, next question, who are your heroes? Well, I've been locked in here. <laughs> for a few weeks like everyone else. And I uh, watched a um, series uh, on Netflix, I believe, entitled Bill's Brain. And I would recommend that to everyone. I think it was just three different episodes. But Bill Gates, there is so much going on in, in, with that man and his mind and his passions that we don't really know or hear about because we can't keep up with all the, the things that he is doing. You know, it he is, he and Melinda are tremendously inspiring to me in the way that they are trying to use the resources that they have access to, to improve the world in many, many, many aspects. So He's a little bit of a hero. And Melinda, I'll put her in that same uh, category. Jeannie, you were a legal executive and you had a number of roles at Great Plains Energy, which is now called Evergy. Uh, you brought up to me something and I wonder if you would allude uh, just a little bit of the war story of a hostile takeover. I'm sure if you could bring us into your world and what it was like as a legal executive. So that shows my age. We haven't uh, heard of very many hostile takeovers in the in the last few years, but there was a time after Barbarians at the Gate that um, that was certainly the uh, corporate challenge today as dissident shareholders. But it certainly consumed a couple of years of my life. And who was involved? West Star Energy, who ultimately ended up a few years ago. Actually, I think it was I hate to say this, but I think it might have been 20 years almost to the day of the hostile takeover that uh, they ended up merging. So in a lot of ways, well, it was an all-encompassing experience, and but a lot of ways, it was a great experience because I learned more during that period of time than I ever learned. And in order to succeed, which we did at that, um, but at a cost, but you had to work as a team. And not only your internal team, but we had to have uh, external people on our team, communications, legal, financial. And it was a fabulous experience for me to learn how to really be just one cog in a wheel of a, of a team for success. So it was fabulous experience, even though grueling. What advice would you give attorneys who are stuck in their role and want to find ways to be promoted? What would you tell them? I think you have to be a business business partner. So I think it's really important to understand the business and you know how you can bring value. 
and this is true whether you're an attorney or anyone else, I don't think you can sit in your office or in today's world, sit at home and wait for someone to bring your assignments or bring issues to you. You know, you have to be able to see the opportunities where there's legal principles and the law can help your business. And you need to be able to bring those forward. So it's constantly thinking about how can my area add value to the organization and being just as uh, fixated on that as you are your assignments that are due at the end of the week. And if a private practice attorney wanted to come in-house and say you're at Great Plains as the general counsel, and one of your outside counsel knocked on your door and said, I'd love to come work for you, what advice would you give folks or give that person who had that aspiration to go in-house? Well, first of all, most of the attorneys for at least medium size and larger corporations do come from in-house. So that's, you know, that's the uh, place they come from. So typically, prior to coming in-house, you will have served that particular client as external counsel. And probably you've been a very good fit, a good fit for their legal needs, a good fit with their team. And that's probably why you're interested in in going in-house there. So if you are interested in going in-house and you're a business attorney, you actually have kind of a time to test test drive a lot of different corporations because I sincerely believe, and I tell my students this all the time, Your success or failure in your career is based on your fit. You can take the same person and put them in one organization. They will be a huge success. Put them in another organization and a huge failure based on their fit with the organization. So best of all worlds for outside attorneys, you can see where you would be a good fit. And if it's obvious to you, it's probably obvious to the client as well. Last question, Jeannie, and it's two parts. The first part is maybe a little more serious. The second part is more playful. So first question, uh, Jeannie, what are your superpowers or your single superpower? What are my superpowers? I, first of all, I'm not sure I have any, but if I did, I think the reason I love teaching strategy and I enjoyed strategy and practice too, is because one of the elements of strategy is that you have to be able to see the future, at least in different scenarios, in order to put strategies in place. And I've always felt, and maybe no one else feels that way but me, that I was able sometimes to see the future or get um, at least an idea of what the future was going to be like. So if I, if I had a strength, that might be it. And the second part of the question was, what is your kryptonite? I am very strong-willed. And sometimes I am so strong-willed in my viewpoint that I am not as open as I should be in gathering lots of information in before I make decisions. Jeannie, it's been an honor and a pleasure. Thank you for your time today. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone who listened to this episode of the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. If you haven't already, please take a moment and subscribe. Also, we would love your feedback. You can leave feedback in three easy ways. You can go to the blog post on our website. You can click Give Feedback link in the show notes on your device. And then thirdly, you can text the phrase LFL podcast to the number 44222. That's LFL P-O-D-C-A-S-T. And thank you. Thank you for listening to the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. This podcast is for education purposes only. This content cannot be used for commercial use without written permission from the Lion Group. If you like this podcast, leave a review on iTunes.